I'll get the recording started. All right. Well, welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Julie. I'm the events manager at Roundabout Books. Um, we are so grateful for everyone who has continued to support our events um, virtually. I know that people are invited to a lot of Zoom events throughout the week. And so we're just so appreciative that you've taken the time to join us for this uh, author talk tonight. I'm really excited because we got to have Ted in the store last year for the Mirror Pond Murders, which was the second in these books. And now we are going to be talking about the Mount Bachelor Murders, which the snowy cover is so perfect for what is going on outside right now. And this is the third of his books. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to pick it up yet, uh, please do so at the store. If you are unable to come in, we do offer delivery once a week. It's called Owl Post. You can mention it when you give us a call or um, put in an online order. And if you don't want to come into the store for COVID reasons, we have the red bench in front of the store where you can still pick up your books. They will be wrapped with your name on it so no one knows what it is. And um, that way you're still supporting Roundabout, but if you're not comfortable coming in the store or can't make it out right now, we totally understand. Just give us a call. We'll always put books on hold for people. So let's go ahead and get started tonight. So um, as I mentioned, this is uh, the third book in Ted Haynes' Northwest Murder Mystery Series. So um, as you can see, they have, you know, titles that are related to this area. So um, Ted, I'm actually just going to hand it on over to you because I can't wait to hear more about this and the continuation of these characters and stories from the previous. So please, everyone, welcome Ted Haynes. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. Thank you very much, Julie. I appreciate it. Um, glad, glad to see you all. And uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit how I came to came to be writing books in the center, uh, uh, a little bit about what uh, critics might have said about this book. And uh, I will do a very, very uh, brief reading to give you a slight flavor, flavor of it, uh, talk about my writing process, but I'm eager to get to your questions and comments uh, uh, quickly. So I will move along here. Um, uh, Joan and I first came to Central Oregon in 1975, uh, and we finally built a house on the Little Deschutes River in 2007. And uh, I've spent a lot of time then ever since. I have, uh, uh, we've not only enjoyed the recreation and the scenery, but we've to some extent become members of the community. I'm a member of the Central Oregon uh, Writers Guild of Central Oregon, Master Swimmers, uh, the uh, Deschutes Historical Museum, and uh, most proudly of the uh, uh, Waterston Prize for Desert Writing which is a prize which is given an annually, internationally, but it's centered in, in Bend and, and recently started a high school prize for students in Central Oregon who write uh, essays about the desert, often, well, about the Eastern Oregon desert. Um, and that the Waterston Prize has recently been taken over by the High Desert Museum. Um, so I've, I've done the kayaking and hiking and things you do in Central Oregon. Um, and one thing I've been very interested in, in is fiction set in, there are quite a few writers who live in Bend, but there's a growing body of literature which is set in Bend. And uh, on my website, uh, tedhaines.com, uh, uh, there's a list of books that are, are set in Bend. There are about 12 authors. Some of them have more than one book set in Bend. Um, and they're pretty exciting. I, I wanna mention one of the most recent ones. It is also the most expensive one. Uh, it is a it is a hardback comic book. You see, it's really thick, and uh, it reminded me what it is kind of a thrill it is for the people who live in Bend uh, to, who uh, read enough novels that are set in New York City to uh, read about read a book that's uh, set in Bend because the uh, the author uh, writes about uh, going. Uh, cross-country skiing with her husband and finding nobody brought lunch. And they're pretty upset about it. And uh, then they have an argument about bananas. Seems to be a very serious argument. And they, they stop at the, uh, the Newport Market, Newport Avenue Market. Well, I'll tell you, it's kind of a thrill to get to that page 
and say, I've been to the Newport Avenue market and I know where the bananas are. And uh, so I hope that there are some thrills kind of like that for people who know the area or who have been to the area um, to uh, encounter places they've seen and perhaps see them in a new light. I doubt when you were there that you uh, saw any murders and uh, just as well to see them uh, at a distance. Um, the first book I wrote it was uh, actually nonfiction. Uh, the house that my wife and I have is on a ranch that used to be uh, a cattle ranch uh, for a hundred years in the same family. So I wrote a history of that ranch along with uh, a lady who uh, grew up on the ranch. She was born in 1929, and grew up uh, with uh, uh, no running water, uh, no electricity, and uh, lived a, a kind of a, a different life. So we had fun writing that together. And um, after that, I began writing fiction. My first book was a uh, book of uh, short stories. It's called uh, On the Road to Burn. The reflection may make it tough to uh, do this, but uh, um, and uh, it, from there, for those of you not from Bend, there are over 100 miles of desert between Burns and Bend. So it's kind of a, a lonely road, but the stories are set all over uh, Central Oregon and take place from the 1850s to uh, 2037. It was just one set in the, in the future. And um, it's kind of fun. And uh, people who wrote newspaper articles about it uh, liked it a lot. It was good. But I, I quickly realized that most people preferred to read stories, particularly mysteries, rather than uh, uh, short stories. So my next book was a, uh, a mystery. Uh, it was called uh, Suspects. And uh, it introduces a, a hero that appears in all the books. His name is Dan Martinez. And he's actually accused of a murder and the sheriff is after him. Uh, and he figures, well, he'll never figure out who the real murderer is, he's an amateur. But what he can do is research the guy who was murdered and find other people who had a good reason to murder him. And he finds a lot of people that had a good reason to murder this guy. And, his, and the thought is, well, if this ever comes to trial, I can say, you know, you can't convict me beyond a reasonable doubt. Look at all these other people who could have done it. Well, in the process, he stumbles across the guy who actually did the murder and he almost gets killed in the process. So it's, a, um, it's, it's, it's kind of a thriller and kind of fun. And then uh, I introduce another, another character in the next book, which I know some of you have read and I appreciate that, uh, the, called the, the Mirror Pond Murders. Mirror Pond is right in the center of Bend. It's a kind of a wide spot in the Deschutes River. There actually was a murder there in uh, 1962, but this uh, is more about a fictional murder, murder in uh, 1985. Um, and the, uh, the narrator is a, a lady named Sarah Chatham, who's a semi-retired attorney in, uh, in Bend, but uh, she takes an interest in this case and she's very dedicated to justice. And that carries over to the next uh, book about Mount Bashford. Now, as you know, uh, everybody knows, everybody in Bend knows where Mount Bashford is. If you look west from Bend, you, there are three mountains in a row, um, kind of on a ridge. They're called the Three Sisters. And there's another mountain, a very handsome mountain, actually, uh, that's uh, in the shape of a pyramid. It's kind of off by itself. And um, what are Three Sisters without uh, a company's most interested, well, they'd be interested in a bachelor. So how, that's how it got its name. It was called Bachelor Butte, but when they put a ski resort on it, they didn't like that very name very much and they called it uh, Mount Bachelor. Um, so uh, uh, everybody in Central Oregon kind of knows where Mount Bachelor is. And, and it really, is, to some extent, has been the making of Bend. Uh, and my book begins in 1966, which was not the best of times in Bend. There were two big lumber mills, but they had closed because uh, they'd run out of trees to cut. Um, the resorts that are known now, Sun River, uh, Black Butte, others, they didn't exist, were barely in the planning stages. So the hope was uh, for, for Mount Bachelor to, uh, to take off. And there was a, a, quite a history of skiing, though to ski, you kind of had to walk up the hill um, in the past. But there was a lot of skiing in Bend because a lot of the people who worked in the lumber industry 
were of Norwegian descent and uh, they were a very industry. So when I said this in 1966, I had to do a lot of, reserve, uh, uh, of uh, research in terms of what had been and what the ski resort was like back then. Well, um, ben, was, ben at that point, um, and I know you can't really keep, read this, this trail map for, for the, uh, the ski resort back in 1966, but it had two lifts, two double lifts. And if you know Mount Bachelor today, it has uh, um, uh, 11 lifts and uh, uh, 100 trails, 100 ski, ski runs. Uh, and we barely had that in there and, and, the, and the list didn't go as high. So uh, it was fun uh, researching that. And uh, uh, I did that at the uh, Deschutes Historical Museum and uh, I made copies of the bulletin and copies of the, the, the map and all like that. As a matter of fact, the murder uh, takes place uh, right about here on a, on a run called Last Chance, because um, back then, that's the furthest west you could go. Well, now the ski resort goes all the way around the mountain. There's no stopping. If you keep going west, you come around again. Uh, it's enormous and very successful. So uh, I had uh, a lot of fun doing that research. and. Uh, uh, and also going back to that time, because I learned to ski in 1966, not very well, and I didn't learn at Mount Bachelor, but, and the, um, the murderer, and I'm not giving too much away because this is a description of him on the first page. Um, he had far better equipment than I ever had. And also uh, he had better skis and a snapping outfit, but he did have the same kind of goggles that I had from 1966. And uh, you could put different uh, tints in them as you went along. And I, I never knew which tint I was supposed to use, but I thought that this kind of red pink one looked kind of ridiculous. So I never did that, use that one. Um, and then uh, the, uh, if one murder is interesting, I kind of figured the two murders would be more interesting. I had one in the winter, so I figured there ought to be one in the summer. And so I picked a, a site, uh, called uh, uh, Hosmer Lake, which is below Mount Bachelor, which is what it looks like. As a matter of fact, this is on the back cover of the, uh, of the book. Um, and uh, this is a, uh, where another murder takes place in modern times, 2018. And once again, it's uh, very hard to figure out who did the murder or why the heck they did it or whether it was intended to be uh, a murder of a particular person, or it was kind of a, a random shot. Uh, and uh, you can say, I'm not giving away too many spoilers here, but when we discuss this, and I know some of you have read this book, so we'll have a little more freedom to uh, uh, talk about it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, say some of the uh, comments on the Mount Bachelor murders have been good. Cascade Arts and Entertainment said for anyone who loves mysteries in the Pacific Northwest, this is a great story. Reaching back to Ben's Norwegian heritage in the early days of Mount Bachelor Ski Resort. It says the characters themselves tell the story. Sarah Chatham, the heroine who drives the investigations. Sheriff's Detective Sfars Connor, he was in 1966. And Carl Brenniger, uh, Leon Martinez, a PR teacher who recognizes the murderer from a 50 year old drawing. Uh, Dan Martinez, uh, the attorney who practices very little law. Amy Martinez, Dan's beautiful wife, on leave from her scientific career to care for their new daughter. And two killers with radically different motivations. Uh, even Eric Peterson, murder victim, has his say. And I. I I have to say the villain and that victim are some of the most interesting people in the, in the book. So uh, I uh, thought I would uh, read you a little bit from uh, the first detective's attempt to, uh, uh, to uh, grapple with this. Uh, as you know, um, audiobooks, uh, audiobooks are getting very popular these days and people have urged me to write uh, an audio book or turn this into an audio book or turn other books into audio books. Uh, and I've kind of fantasized that, oh yeah, gee, I'd love to do that. And, and uh, I could be the voice of the male characters. And I have a sister who is an actress and a singer. 
and uh, she'd be perfect to read all the female parts, but it's kind of an elaborate undertaking. So I'm, I'm gonna read you about a page and a half here, and that's about as close as it's probably gonna to get to an audio book. This is uh, Sheriff's Detective Forrest Connor back in 1966. People shouldn't trust ice. You're going along on a winter road and the next thing you know, you're out of control and sliding for the guardrail. Not a damn thing you can do about it. Or you can't see out the windshield. Or you fall flat walking across the street. Or your car won't start. My father used to say ice belonged in mint juleps. I grew up where the lakes don't, didn't freeze and the snow didn't stick. I got ordered to Oregon in World War II when I was just a kid to train with the army at Camp, Camp Abbott. That was summer and the snow was far away on the peaks of the mountain. It looked beautiful. A girl I met in Bend, Bend was beautiful too. And I came back after the war to marry her. We were still married. I worked for a lumber company for three years before I joined the sheriff's department. My cousin was in law enforcement back in Birmingham. They told me the desert wasn't far from Bend and I figured I could always go and warm up if I had to. I pictured the sands of Arabia and the sun hot as a barbecue. Well, that dog didn't hunt. The desert here was rocky buttes, sagebrush, and juniper trees, hot enough in the summer, but freezing cold in the winter. They told me it didn't snow that much in the winter in central Oregon. It didn't last that long. That wasn't true either, especially not in the deep woods and up toward the mountains. I met some good people though, including my wife, and I've always liked to work years as a deputy and now as a detective, actually the sheriff's only detective. The county was bigger than the state of Delaware, but had the population of a you never heard of its city. I rode the chairlift up the mountain with Peter Carey, the head of the ski patrol, the man who found the body. Falling snow sat on my trousers without melting. The chairs ahead of us grew fainter in the distance, like they were dissolving. The scraping over pulleys when we passed each pylon made me wait every time to see if the cable slipped and we were falling. Between pylons, I could hear the snow like static on the radio. Worse was to come, I knew, and I set myself for it. Since I could ski about as well as a turtle knows how to fly, they were gonna slide me down the mountain on a sled they used for injured skiers. I would be strapped in, unable to control anything for myself and the ski patrol would enjoy going fast enough to scare the bejesus out of me. I steeled myself to maintain as much dignity as I could. Tell me how you found the body, I said to Peter when we passed another pylon. Just what you saw. We'll talk later about what you thought and what conclusions you came to. We, that is the ski patrol, were checking the borders of the runs for people who had skied out of the groomed slopes. Skiing off piste, we call it, is especially dangerous because of the new snow. Avalanches are more likely to happen. And it's more likely that skiers will get stuck in the snow or fall into a tree well. That's the worst. There's a hollow space under the pine and fir trees because the snow is caught by the branches of the tree and never gets to the ground. Skiers get into a tree well and can't get out. Every time they move, they bring more snow down on top of them. They usually go in head down with their skis up above them. Eventually they suffocate. And skiers could run right into trees, especially if the falling snow cuts their visibility and the trunks are white because the fresh snow stucks, sticks to them. We have to check the borders of the runs all the time when it's snowing. A track you'll see at 10 o'clock can be invis invisible by 11. So you found a track? Yes, two tracks. The second skier pretty much stayed in the first tra skier's tracks. Well, that's about all the ski patrol found in addition to the uh, uh, body. And um, by the time the detective gets there, uh, they can't even see the tracks anymore. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a mystery, who did it, where did they go, and why did they do it? Um, and uh, I thought I would uh, uh, tell you just a little bit how I came to write. Of course, I start with the setting. It's gotta be in Central Oregon. It's gotta be an interesting place in Central Oregon. So I think about, okay, somebody gets murdered there. How do they get murdered? And uh, it develops from there. I pull in the characters that I know, but of course um, the victim is 
might be somebody we kind of know, but the the villain, but not not an continuing character. I need them again. Uh, and the villain is somebody new because at the end of the book, they're going to be convicted or maybe dead. Uh, so I have to invent those characters. Uh, and the, the story uh, evolves as it goes along. Uh, I, I plot it out to make sure the story is going to go somewhere. Uh, and, but then I change it a lot as I go along because uh, you, you can't get all the ideas at the beginning. Uh, you, can't, you can't just get this whole bunch of ideas and say, okay, now I'm going to write this out. Um, the ideas come as you're writing, you get better ideas. Well, that's about uh, all I uh, can think to say, but I, I hope that many of you have uh, uh, questions uh, and or comments or, or complaints. And uh, I think uh, Julie can uh, feel them for us and uh, I'll be happy to answer them and discuss them. Well, first, I just want to say thank you for that little bit of um, history at the beginning too. Um, my family actually came to Central Oregon because of the Brooke Scanlon Mill. So that's kind of fun. Did I freeze up again? Oh, there it goes. Sorry, my internet. But yeah, let's go ahead and open it up to anybody who has questions. Um, feel free to unmute yourself or if you want to put it in the chat, raise your hand so I can kind of see you. Um, but yeah, let's open it up. Linda, did you have one? Um, yeah, Ted, um, are you a skier? Is the, um, did you have to research um, all of that or is a lot of it because you skied bachelor so much that you knew how to incorporate the different parts mm -hmm. of the mountain. Well, actually, I never have skied back bachelor. I had to admit that. I've uh, been up the lift a number of times, summer and winter, uh, and I've been there in the winter. But I, I learned to ski on the East Coast, and uh, which means that, you know, on rocks and ice, I'm not too bad. Uh, in powder, I don't know what to do. But uh, I, uh, so I do know how to ski. So I do uh, have a uh, enough experience to bring that to it. Uh, and uh, I know how to ski and I've seen Bachelor pretty thoroughly. Um, so Jennifer has a question. Um, Jennifer, do you want to ask it or do you want me to read it from the chat? Well, yeah, you can see it there. So, oh, hold on. Okay. Unmute there. Um, good. Yeah, we can hear you. I can hear you now. Okay, good. Yeah. So my question has to do with we get back over there, right? Well, I don't want to say too much, but then at what point you're doing a lot of research, you're doing the research on World War II. At what point do you just go into fiction? Mm -hmm. Um. Well, it's a. Uh... The fiction has to pretty much fit the facts, mm -hmm. um, but uh, the ideas kind of come out of the facts. Uh, it was uh, I was lucky that these uh, that the, back then they had double chairlifts. Now they have quads, you know, four people in a seat uh, and some threes and things like that. But um, because I needed, well, I needed to get the murderer and the victim on the same chair pretty much by themselves. So um, if the facts had been different, you know, a few years later, it wouldn't have worked. Um, and one reason this takes place in 1966 is because I've already, in Mirror Upon Murders, introduced uh, Sarah Chatham as an adult. Uh, and so I need to ever be a teenage girl. So when would that have been? Well, it would have been 1966. So that's uh, part, part of what drove that. All right, and Ken has a question. I think Ken has a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, thank you, and thank you, Ted. Uh, Ted and I, uh, our paths crossed in 1966 and uh, during our college years. And I have read the other three books and uh, I've uh, taken a peek, a big peek at this book. And Ted, I have to say that uh, Your train has left the station with this one. This is uh, this is wonderful. 
And there were there, there, there were three things that I find fascinating. The multi-generation, first of all, 66, moving forward, the multi-generational thing is, 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 is wonderful. And, uh, and the second thing is you, you're now an international thriller. Uh, you know, uh, it, as a matter of fact, I wrote down a couple of quotes. Uh, uh, that's all I can. I can't, I can't help you anymore, son. Uh, so, so the book goes from, from Bend, it goes to Scotland, it goes to Norway. I, I found that fascinating. And the other thing I noticed, because I consider myself a friend, um, your sense of humor is beginning to come out. And, and that just, I, I thought that was an incredible spice to the book. And if I can, only, only two of them, and there are more than two. But, uh, and the one is about uh, Sarah. Uh, that girl was busier than jumper cables in a redneck picnic. <laughs> that is wonderful. And uh, I didn't make that up, but it was a good use of it. <laughs> uh, it's an extremely good use of it. And the, and the other one is this word that I did look up and it was accurate. I thought you made it up, Ted. I didn't <laughs> trust you, so I had to look it up. Well, you know but, me, so. Yeah. Yes, I tried to memorize uh, the scene before my senses got knocked Caddy Wumpus. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I did look up Caddy Wumpus and you're exactly correct with its usage. But mm -hmm. that, the, the, the sense of you, I love it. I love wow. it. I'm not finished it. And the reason I'm not finished it is because like any good book, I don't want it. I don't want it to go away. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so very kind. That's, you know, I only got 75 pages left and I'm holding on to them because I don't want to yeah. let them go. So thank yeah. you, Ted. Well, thank you. And, and thank you for your uh, help or, or, and earlier comments on the book. Um, I also want to thank uh, Barb Tate. I don't know if she's going to ask a question, but, but uh, she was uh, good enough to read my previous books and comment on them. But she was especially helpful with this book because there are a number of scenes in uh, Redmond that take place in 1966. And I don't think Barb was in Redmond, but her husband was in Redmond in 1966. Um, and, uh, and she uh, knows Redmond today and her husband knows it from 1966. So they, they were helpful in my putting this together. Let's see here, actually, Barbara, if you want to unmute, we can. Thank you. Um, I am, I have not finished this book yet, but I have to say that you have, I have never had so many cliffhangers in, you know, in a short period of time. And I, and it's great because it just keeps me enthralled. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, I really also appreciate getting the backstory on mm -hmm. Sarah. And I look forward to having both Sarah and Dan in future murder mysteries. Uh -huh. of you. Good. Yeah, yeah Good. They're, they're very, um, very relatable, mm -hmm. very real. The, your, your characters just feel real. You know, mm -hmm. like I, I feel like when I'm reading it, I'm actually having a conversation with mm -hmm. them. And I, I like, I feel very involved. Yeah, drawn well, that's in. good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I appreciate it. And I, I think uh, that's one advantage of, of having different characters narrate different right. chapters. Uh, but there are um, some disadvantages. Sometimes I think uh, it's a little hard to keep track of who's talking. Um, and also maybe a little hard to bond with the with, uh, with the characters that they change, but I think at the beginning it's a little it's a little bit of a challenge, but then you get to know the voice of each character, and after then it's makes it a lot easier. Good. Yeah. Good. So I like it. I like that device personally. Oh, thank you. Good. Great. Um, you you mentioned cliffhangers, and that's also kind of a trade off. Um, <clears throat> when, when when you write a book, you want cliffhangers, you want suspense, and you want surprises, or some surprise. And uh, because 
if everything is absolutely predictable, it's going to be a boring book. It's hardly a book worth right. reading. But on the other hand, you can overdo it. Uh, if you have too many unlikely events, it's it it sort of stops um, being believable. If as as Jennifer asked, if you get too far away from reality, like this could never happen, uh, then uh, then people kind of lose interest. Uh, right, right. But but I do take some liberties, and other people take some liberties. I'm I'm reminded of. Uh, 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 Benjamin Percy, who, who grew up in Tumalo, and he wrote books, some stories set in the area. And he wrote uh, a book that's set in the area called The Wilding. And in, uh, in, that, in that book, or in one of the stories, he, uh, he talks about Hole in the Ground, well known. It's kind of a deep crater, kind of a strange place. And he talks about it as though it were a short bicycle ride from Tumalo, which is right near Bend. Well, as many of you know, yeah. it's about a two hour drive from yeah. Tumalo to Hole in the Ground. But in fiction, it can be a lot closer. Right. So I haven't taken quite as many liberties as he has. All right. So do we have any other questions? Um, Cause I actually have a few. If, that would be great. Uh, yeah. So um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is how do you know when your characters need another book? I know, I've, I feel like someone asked you this when we were talking about the Mirror Pond um, mm -hmm. murders last year because you had written the first one and maybe, you know, a character, like I'm, I like serial mystery books, you know, those people who have been writing them say maybe they have 20 books and sometimes maybe that's too many but what is it about maybe a couple of these characters that told you they had more to say mm -hmm. well I, I i liked the characters and uh i thought that they uh dan has a uh certainly a curiosity and a certain uh risk-taking uh attitude for life which in, in this book gets him in trouble with his wife uh, and may get him in trouble with her again. Uh, and, uh, and Sarah has a great feeling for uh, justice. Uh, not in this book, but in the previous book, we learned that when she was 16, she realized that her, bio, she found out that her biological grandmother was Cherokee uh, and that she was one quarter Cherokee. And as an attorney, she's uh, done a lot of work on behalf of Indian tribes all over the country and uh, as an advocate for them. Uh, and, and so she has a, uh, a strong feeling for justice, which, which verges on revenge sometimes. And I think that uh, serves uh, the stories uh, uh, well too. So I, I, I like uh, what they can do. Uh, there's a character, Dan's father, Leon Martinez, the, the artist, who is not, um, you know, not so dogged about pursuing things, but he's perceptive and he cares about stuff. And he's a very likable uh, character, I think. So I, I just like writing about him and uh, uh, I like to see him again. Yeah. So I, I think, and I think, I think readers appreciate knowing these characters. I mean, um, when you suddenly read about uh, Leon Martinez in this book, you say, well, well, I know who Leon Martinez is, and I remember what he did before. Um, and uh, I know by some quirk of nature, he's got a old Maserati, which isn't in this book, but you might remember it from a previous book. Previous book. So that's kind is, of is, uh, is it? Uh -huh. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Sometimes I'll tell you, <laughs> I have trouble remembering what's in in the book sure. <laughs> <laughs> well that kind of leads me to another was, one then uh, um are was any, one of the uh, oh sorry go ahead oh are any of your no, characters ask your question. modeled on someone you know that's a good question um but and the answer is actually no because i'm scared to death of somebody 
saying, wait a minute, you can't do that. I'm taking you to court. And, and it's partly that and, and uh, part, partly it'd be sort of impolite. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't like to find that some characters uh, uh, in a book is, is modeled on me. Um, unless of course he's taller and younger. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but no, I, I don't think I'd like that. I wouldn't want to do that to my, to my friends. That's, yeah, that's probably a smart idea. Um, <laughs> so so um, I wanted to know maybe what other writers have influenced you. And a, a second part to that is um, if you could recommend one or two other mysteries besides yours um, that you think people should read. Well, um, I, I'm certainly not trying to be some other writer. I'm certainly not trying to copy any other writer, but there are some, of course, that uh, I have to acknowledge that the most obvious one is uh, 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 Agatha Christie. Uh, I like the fact that her detectives are amateurs, even though uh, Miss Marple solved a lot of mysteries. She's, she's not with the police. Um, I like, I admire Scott Turow for writing about the legal interstices of this, which I think are, are interesting. And they're certainly in this book. And, and I think I've kind of got them right. And, and uh, Ken has not read the whole book, but he read the end of it for me. And uh, he was kind enough to say, well, that, you know, seems reasonable a judge would decide that. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm kind of fascinated by that. Uh, in terms of the multiple narrators, I was introduced by, uh, influenced by Hillary Jordan, uh, who wrote a, a book called Mud Brown, Mudbound. And I think she has three or four narrators in it. And, and she does a terrific job with the different voices of them. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I admire that. And uh, I uh, I also have read uh, Robert Penn Warren's uh, All the King's Men, which, which I think is just, just a beautiful book. And he does some things with uh, mm -hmm. images and phrases uh, that I, I can't do, but I can, I can admire and kind of uh, step in that direction. So those are some influences. In terms of mysteries, um, uh, well, uh, I, I like Scott Thoreau. I think Presumed Innocent is just a, just a terrific book. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I don't read a lot of other mysteries. Um, I kind of make them up on my own. I, um, uh, I have my own mysteries. <laughs> um, we have a question. We have a couple of questions in the chat. The first one is, have you had any requests for the movie rights for these books? No, but I'm open to them. <laughs> I think it would be great. I think uh, I haven't really, I haven't pursued them either, but I think uh, someone told me that uh, movie companies really like to have something uh, tangible that mm -hmm. they can uh, seize on. And I think that the more books there are in this series, the more likely it is that somebody is going to say, you know, you know, we could buy them all uh, and uh, we could keep going with this. And there are some things to, uh, to recommend that. I mean, shooting a film at Ben, I mean, the scenery is terrific. And mm -hmm. uh, it's enough of a, I won't call it a frontier town, but it's enough kind of on the raw edge that you have a, a variety of, of a, you know, you have, you know, ranches that are not far away, wildernesses not far away, and yet you have some, uh, you know, civilization, right, culture, right in Bend. Um, so I'm, I'm just thinking that you know, if I write enough of these books, somebody will want to make a movie out of it. Yeah. That would be very cool. Um, Christine asked, what advice would you give to someone writing a mystery? And she had a second question of, are there any mystery writing groups in Central Oregon? that I know of, the Central Oregon Writers Guild has writing groups. Um, I don't know that there are any centered on uh, mysteries. Um, uh, and, and I think I missed the, the, the first uh, question. 
uh, what, advice, read... what, what advice would you give to someone writing a mystery? Um, well, I think you have to make it your own. You have to uh, uh, write about what you yourself are, are interested in or what aspects. Well, uh, I think, who was it who said done? As a, as a very well-known author, you may even recognize the quote that, uh, oh, she wrote, I think she wrote The Color Purple because she said, I wrote that book because I wanted to read it. <laughs> so uh, I uh, I think uh, I, the best advice, well, one piece of advice, it's not the best advice, but one piece of advice is write a book that you would like to re read. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, Christine, if you, yeah, Alice Walker wrote that. Um, Christine, you should reach Alice out Walker. to the Oregon Writers Guild, though. Um, I'm on the board, and I know that there are people in the group that are mystery writers. So if you wanted to find a critique group, that would be the best way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, awesome. Do we have any any final questions? Um, I think one of the ones uh, that, of course, everyone will want to know, and we ask all authors, is, are you working on a new book? Yes. Yes. Well, uh, matter of fact, I am. Uh, it, it's set in uh, uh, Bend, of course. Uh, and uh, if the biggest attraction in Bend is Mount Bachelor, the biggest event annually in Bend, as many of you know, is, is a race. Uh, it's called the Pole Pedal Paddle. And the racers start on Mount Bachelor, they, they ski downhill, then they do cross country skiing, and then they um, get on a bicycle, ride fast as they can down to Bend, run for a mile and a half, uh, jump in a kayak and paddle up and down the Deschutes River, which is pretty cold in May when uh, uh, they, I, I think they have to hold this race when there's still snow on the mountain, but there's no ice in the river. Uh, and then they, uh, they sprint to the end. So the name of the race is the pole uh, pedal paddle. So my, the name of my book, which is sent against the background of this rake is, is pole pedal murder. Uh, I came with, up with that title uh, a couple of years ago and I thought that is a good title. I'm gonna <laughs> have to write that book. So, um, so that, it's, it's set against that and uh, 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 Dan and his wife, uh, Amy, are, are going to be a, a team in the race, uh, uh, alternating uh, 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 legs of the race. So there's going to be a bit of, of, of racing in there in addition to uh, the murder mystery or mysteries. Great. Good. Thanks for that question. Yeah, that, that's an interesting um, setting. It gives you a lot of options because there's so many people who come into town from, from elsewhere during that time. Uh, I've started writing it. I've rewritten the first three chapters about three times and uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to change it as I go along, but it, it'll be fun and, and uh, I thank you for the question. And um, I appreciate your interest. It's been a, a lot of fun for me. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, uh, thanks very much for paying attention. Yeah, thank you everyone for being here. Just a reminder, we have the book at the bookstore. Give us a call if you want one reserved or come on by. We're open um, every day of the week from 10 to five. And again, thank you again, Ted, um, for being here and for everyone taking uh, time out of your day to Zoom with us. Uh, we can't wait to have live events again, but until then, these Zoom events have just been so much fun. So, oh wait. Linda, did you? Hold on, you're still muted. Go ahead. Weird, this thing just came up. Anyway, I was just putting the applause up, but I accidentally hit the raised hand. Okay. I see. Oh. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Great. Thanks. Nice. Zoom is good to see you all. Ed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Julie. Thanks, 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 Thanks